able to condense those timelines to be able to catch up in a healthy way. Um, people end up doing these things that they probably wouldn't have done if not for the fact that they felt like they were having to have some big win to get them back in the game. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's one thing that I that definitely preach for people to avoid that no matter how old you are, no matter what milestone you're about to hit or, or just hit, that as long as you're still breathing, you've got plenty of time. You know, I, I would 100% agree with that. And from like how you should frame your thinking, I mean, for me and – Granted, I'm a pretty radical thinker, right? Like most of the time, the way I'm thinking, people are confused. Like they're like, yeah. what the fuck are you saying? You know, sure. but like for me, like I always get super caught up on the idea of goal setting. Like, you know, I, I see people on online talking about goal setting, all this shit. And like, I, I, I get, I get it. Right. Mm -hmm. But like the only reason I even look at it somewhere where I would want to be in a year or two years or whatever is so that I can reverse engineer daily task. And that is it, right? Like whenever I wake up in the morning, I don't think, hey, how can I, like, where am I going to be in six months? Or how am I going to be able to afford this in six months? Like, mm -hmm. I literally wake up with only the intention of going 100% all, all day today. Yeah, and it's, it's the only way I can string together any reasonable amount of good work. Because if you ask me, hey, can you, like, with complete honesty say, can you, uh, you go all in for the next 300 days? You're listening to the Wake Up Wealthy Podcast, the only podcast that helps you turn pro in mind, body, spirit, and business. What is up, Wake Up Wealthy listeners? Welcome to the Wake Up Wealthy Podcast, where we show you how to max out in mind, body, spirit, and business. It's your host, Brody Kern, and today with us, we have got Mr. Tyler Jack Harris. I'm super excited to have you on, dude. Uh, you know, since we met, you know, for a little bit of background to everybody, Tyler and I met because he hit me up. I went on his podcast, the breadwinner podcast, and I've just, I'm just totally invested in this guy. Um, as a person, you know, we've built a good relationship since then and I'm excited to have you on dude. How are you? Dude, I'm incredible. I uh, appreciate the kind words and it's definitely, uh, definitely likewise love uh, watching what you're doing. And, uh, it just goes to show this crazy social media thing. You can actually meet some interesting people in the world. <laughs> crazy, crazy. And you know, just the, the power of it, like if I remember correctly, so you have, you have an account, just like a, a motivation, you know, content curation account separate from your personal account. Yep. And it commented on one of my posts and said, Hey, let's connect. And you know, I must have just been ready to, you, you know, go down a little <laughs> rabbit hole that day. Usually, like, I'm not doing that, you know, but yeah. scrolled through it, found that you were the owner. We connected, did the podcast, and, like, it, Instagram really is just nuts. I mean, because, like, there was no other way that we – eventually, we would have met. Sure. Right? We know some of the same people. Sure. But, I mean, dude, what a cool experience. So, for the people who – on here who don't know who you are, I, I love to, to, and especially if someone has an interesting story, which, you know, from what I know you do, I want to go through that. Tell us how you started, how you became Tyler Jack Harris. Sure, man. Uh, I think, you know, the best way to tell my story is to just to kick it off at right about four and a half years ago, because before that, it was a pretty normal story. Um, you know, normal upbringing, good parents, good family, good home, all that good stuff. Went to Clemson University, so we're still riding the high of the uh, national championship. Uh, it's a good time to be a Clemson Tiger at the moment. Um, but, you know, after school, went into my professional career, was a financial advisor, uh, and then life happened. Uh, I had a failed marriage. I had a failed business. And I found myself, um, you know, as cliche as rock bottom sounds, I found myself at, at a low and was broke. I was in debt. I was depressed. I was out of shape. I was just in a terrible spot. And, and had one. How yeah. old were you at this point? At that point, I was, let's see, 29, 29. Okay. Uh, I was 29 at the, at, at the end, so like when I had really made the switch. Uh, okay. But over about a two-year period, so from 27 to 29, man, I was just playing the victim. Uh, I was pointing fingers at everybody else and was completely content with saying, oh, well, my wife did this, my, uh, my last employer did this. And was just using that as an excuse to be lazy and, and just not doing anything with my life uh, until finally kind of had one of those wake up moments uh, since we're on the wake up wealthy podcast. I had one of those wake up moments and where I finally took ownership and really finally, finally accepted the blame and understood that everything that I had done, every situation that had happened to me, that I was exactly where I was supposed to be based on the decisions I had made in my life. Like it was all my fault. 
And, you know, I always get pushed back on that, especially from the relationship side, because I had a wife that had an affair and uh, after multiple, um, you know, attempts to make it work, uh, it didn't. And then people would say, well, man, that wasn't your fault. That wasn't your fault that she cheated on you. I'm like, well, you know, if I had created the absolute best environment in my home and was the absolute best husband in the world, would it have still happened? Maybe, but probably not. Uh, so it's my fault. I didn't take ownership of that situation. And with my business, uh, the crazy things that happen uh, with the failure of, of my business, you know, some of it out of my control, maybe, but should it, all of it have been in my control? Yes. And so that's my fault. And, and so the encouragement coming out of that was figuring out that, hey, if I got myself into this mess, then guess what? I could get myself out of it. But the only variable uh, of that ultimate success would be work. And so I put my head down, started working really on myself first, because again, I was at a low place. My confidence had been beaten down. Um, yeah, yeah. So let's, let's, pa let's pause there for a minute. I mean, yeah. you, you, you covered a ton, dude. And, and okay, so you're 29 years old, right? You have, you have this experience, 27 to 29, playing the victim. Was this yep. the first real bit of like extreme hardship that you had been through up until that point? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, so, I mean, you're obviously sharp guy, like before yep. then, you know, good parents went to school, graduated, came out, you were financial, like everything you were just cruising, right? Yeah, yeah I was doing well. And, and I remember, I remember having a conversation with my dad one time saying, uh, you know, everything can't go right forever. You know, I, I can't just continue on this upward trajectory and not have something happen. And I remember a lot of times being in fear of, you know, what's like, Man when is the shoe going to drop? Like when, wh like when, and, and how bad is it going to be? Because I knew that life can't just happen perfectly for people and that we all go through pain. We all go through struggles. And I remember honestly being in fear of that because things had, you know, I worked for everything I had and I worked to be in the position I was in, but I, I was fortunate at the time. Um, and yeah, when I, when, when the marriage failed and then when the business failed and then I found myself in this situation, it was the first time where I felt hopeless. It was the first time that I didn't know what to do. Like I didn't have the answer. And, uh, and so I just, you know, spent a couple of years there, which, you know, those are years that, <laughs> that I can't get back. Um, but there are transformative years that I look back on now with so much gratitude, uh, because I know that I'm the person I am right now because of having gone through that. Yeah. So that's powerful yeah. for me to be, to have been able to experience. I wish I could have experienced it, you know, five, 10 years earlier. And I wish there was a course or a pill that I could give somebody that would just destroy their life in like 30 days and they could go, go ahead and build it back. That way you can go through these things as, as quick as possible. So there's a couple of things that I want to talk about there. I mean, the first thing I want to double back for a minute and just say to the listeners, you know, really take note of the level of ownership that, you know, Tyler had assumed there. I mean, there, there's a big difference between um, also taking ownership, like where everyone, you know, who was telling you like, well, maybe that wasn't your fault, right? Like what it comes down to is holding on to what is in and out of your control, like letting go of something that's out of your control, but still taking ownership of the situation, the positioning of what got you there. And I just want to commend you for that, dude. I mean, obviously it's why you are developed to the point that you are now because you take, that's why you're a great leader. Like you take that level of ownership and you know, that's one of the most notable things that people can do. Um, so I, I want to take a minute to acknowledge that. And then second, I want to talk about the, this idea of giving someone a pill to destroy their life. Right? Like <laughs> I, because I have this fear, right? And you and I have talked about this before. Um, because me, I'm so grateful that like my life was so fucked up at 21. Sure. Right? That I had to do what I had to do. But like, I fear for like, my kid, like, do you ever fear for like your, your children, or the way that your dad probably did saying, Hey, this can't go good forever. Like, what happens when a kid grows up affluent, and it, you know, is around the right things? Like, do they develop? Yeah, it's, it's certainly, it's certainly something that I think about um, because, you know, I've got a daughter and I plan on, you know, raising her in the most incredible environment imaginable. Um, but I think it all, you know, the struggle and the pain and, and the things that will happen will be in relation to your situation. So, I mean, like, you know, hers may not be as bad from a universal standpoint, but it may be bad for her in her life. Right. You know, so it may just be, the context may be different. She may not be like in an alleyway doing drugs, hopefully, yeah. but she may have her version of that. 
you know, like yeah. whatever that may be. But I just get so excited when I hear people's stories and they start going, you know, down this path of this downward spiral and the story's just getting just dirtier and grittier and lower and lower. When I know that person's made that switch and made that transition, it makes me so much, so much more excited because I know that the lower it got, the higher they can go. It's almost directly proportionate to how low it went, how low it got to how far they can go with their life if they have made that transition. That's why I was excited about your story. I was just like, holy crap. Like I, I, I envy that. Like I get to where I envy crazy bad stories now. Uh, I mean, it's why both of us really loved the Goggins story. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. And anytime, like I sat down with a guy the other day uh, for lunch and he just unloaded like his life story. I mean, it was deep, dark. It was bad. And as soon as he got done unloading all of the stuff for me, he's just like, so what do you think about that? And my response was like, man, I'm so freaking excited. And he was like, what? I'm like, yeah, I'm so excited because I can tell you've already made that switch in your mind and that you are on an upward trajectory. And the fact that it got that bad proves to me how good it's going to be in your life. And, and like, I'm envious of your story. Like I, I love, I love just having that perspective on life. Because you realize that, I mean, the, the quote that I love and, and go lean back on so often is that God gives his strongest uh, battles to its toughest warriors. Uh, if you think about that, like that's why someone's going through some, something so difficult because they're the only person that can handle that. And they're the only person that can take from that and then help a million other people understand that what they're going through may not be the worst thing in the world. Uh, and look what I got through. And then if I can get through it, then maybe you can too. Yeah, man, man, <laughs> I, I knew, th I knew that this thing was going to start off good. We got a lot of, yeah. we got, yeah. we got a lot of places to go there. So, okay. So, you, you know, let's get back on the timeline for a minute, right? So you are yep. you're 29 years old. You said it's time for me, time for me to pull out of this, right? I'm going to take yep. ownership. Um, what does that look like? You're divorced. Where are you, are you living like in an apartment by yourself? Like what's going on, man? So I was living in, I was renting out a room in my uh, good friend, his house. And it was a tiny, tiny room. I was living there for a little while. Then I moved up to Ohio, helping a guy launch a business. And I was living in the basement of a guy that I met off Craigslist uh, in his house, which was just a crazy whole other story. But, um, you know, I, I, felt, I, I got to a place where I felt like I needed to be alone um, for a while. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty religious guy, uh, pretty strong Christian, um, I would say. And I felt like God put me in a situation where I had to be alone so that I could finally hear him, uh, that I could finally get to a place where I was not distracted with all the noise. I always you know, went from living in a family full of people to a uh, college where I was in a fraternity house with 10 other people to straight into marriage with, where I was with someone that was never alone ever. And right. being, and, and I'm, and I'm, you know, even though I'm introverted, I, I like being around people. Um, and so I think it was the very first time that I'd ever been truly alone. And I probably had some of the greatest moments of clarity, greatest moments of just personal growth um, by being all by myself and being able to kind of reflect on where I'm at and where I wanted to go. Uh, but then I met my now wife and uh, we got married kind of still in this transitional process for me. Like I still had no idea what I was going to do. Um, some mentors came into my life at that time and they gave me an opportunity to get involved in the business that they had built. And it was in the life insurance business, which is the business that I'm still in now. I'm now part owner of that company um, kind of jokingly say if they had sold, you know, rubber bands that I'd be, you know, building a rubber band empire at the, at the time, but, uh, it was just what they were doing. So I, w I was all in, it was based on my trust in them, the integrity that they had. And they gave me an opportunity, uh, to dive head first into something. And that is really what I needed. Uh, it was a okay, fast, so, yeah, go ahead. So, so at this, at this point, right. So my question is, you know, life insurance, uh, you know, was it that far of a jump from the financial planning that you were doing beforehand as far as sales and everything? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it was very, I didn't do a lot of life insurance sales as a financial advisor. We were basically just pushing um, investment products, but, right. but yeah, I mean, not, not crazy far fetched, but I had to go and get my license and all that. Right. Kind of stuff. Right. Okay. And then, so were you really skilled at this time? Like I, we're, we're going to talk about it here, you know, in the next 45 sure. seconds, the accomplishments that you had, but did you, were you skilled? Not really. 
Okay. Not really. Like I, you know, I don't think there was any particular like talent or gift that I had that made them say, okay, this guy has to do this because of that. Um, I was just in a place where my back was up against the wall and I couldn't afford to lose. Yeah. Uh, yep. and, I, and, and that ultimately was what led to the um, coming successes. Yeah. So, to, I mean, so late on us, what happened next? Yeah. So went, you know, put my head down and went to work. I didn't even change my you know, career status on my personal Facebook profile. I didn't tell anybody what I was doing because, you know, I had gone from sales job to sales job, either getting fired or quitting, you know, for that period of two years where I was still playing the victim. And so I just didn't want to have, you know, one more thing that, that Tyler was trying out there. Uh, so I just put my head down, went to work. I was spending, you know, over 200 nights on the road in a hotel uh, every year and sold a lot of life insurance. It was a highly uh, fast paced environment a very transactional environment, which looking back now played exactly into what I needed at that time, which is my confidence was at an all time low. Mm -hmm. I needed to find something where I could go insert work and get a result quickly, which then built my confidence, built my confidence, built my confidence, more work goes in, more results go out. And it was exactly what I needed to kind of get my mojo back really. And uh, once I got into that environment and really mastered that system, I then was focused on what was possible. Like I knew that I could, could do well, but I wanted to see how much I could exploit this system and how many policies I could possibly sell. And in the process, break every single record that ever really existed. So people at that time in the company, you know, they were selling 20 policies a week, 30 policies a week. Some would do like randomly 40, 50. All of a sudden I bust out the first hundred policy week. Then I bust out 200 policies in a week. Then I did like 238 in four days. Then I did like 300 and something in, in 10 days and just start absolutely crushing, um, you know, volume. And what we're doing ended up selling over 8,000 life insurance policies in three and a half years, uh, face to face one at a time. These are not group policies where everybody just came in and signed up. These were sitting down with people one-on-one -on -one, knee to knee, um, and then making the decision to buy or, or not. And uh, the only thing I attribute that to is just an insanely, just almost disgusting work ethic at that time. I mean, I was working 16, 18 hour days um, every single day and on the road all the time, staying in nasty little hotels at the time as I was building my way back up. And uh, it was just, you know, putting the work in and uh, getting some results and then, um, you know, seeing the fruits of those labors over time to where then I started leading a team and then now getting the opportunity to buy in and be uh, an owner of our agency. And we've, you know, launched agencies since then. Yeah, man. I mean, dude, what an incredible three and a half years. I mean, really just shattering oh, yeah. records. I mean, you're talking about d doing 200 closes in four days or whatever, 238 closes in four days. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't even like it. I don't even know how you'd have that many conversations in that, that amount of hours, right? Like it's fucking nuts. Yeah. And, and, and to like, it's so crazy thinking back. And I love the fact that this was, you know, we're only talking about four and a half years ago, so I can remember it like it was yesterday. Um, as I was going through this transition, I mean, you know, going from being flat broke, like I had to borrow, I think it cost like 500 bucks for me to get started and get my license and all that. I had to borrow that 500 bucks to do that. And then 12 months later, I had made $303,000 in commissions. Uh, right. Like $303,000 was deposited into my bank account the next 12 months. Like, yeah. The next, the next 12 months, $450,000 was deposited. In the next 12 months, $650,000 was deposited. And at that point, I became part owner of, of a company that's worth millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars, that ownership piece. Um, and like it literally sometimes it, I just pinch myself. But you know, the thing is, man, like I love the fact that I earned it. <laughs> like it would, it would make me so uncomfortable to sit here and talk to you about where I'm at now and income and, and net worth and things like that and not have earned it, like been handed it. But the fact that like, I know the blood, sweat and tears, I know the 238 nights in a hotel room when it's the last thing I wanted to do was stay another night in the freaking, you know, not, not the greatest hotel room when I could be at home with my wife and then home with my wife and, and daughter. Like I know the hours that went into that. And so I love the fact that I can look back and know that I earned every single penny of it. Um, and to me, that's something super special. Yeah, man. I mean, and the, the like 
the thing that people comment on the most about my story, you also have as well, which is interesting to me. And I want to talk like things can happen so quickly. Like it's been four years since I went to rehab. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Right. Like we're working on the same, like, like things like, I mean, my life is radically different than it even was two years ago. Like two years ago, I probably maybe a little over two years ago, I still thought like, Dude, like you're just supposed to be a real estate agent in Springfield, Missouri. Absolutely. Like, and, and, and like, I don't, it's like, you don't want to give people this um, false representation that like it'll happen overnight, but it can happen so quickly. Like it, in, in a year, I think what's the, what's the quote? People, people um, underestimate, let's see, they underestimate, they overestimate what they can get done in a day, but they underestimate what they can get done in a matter of three months or something like that. Like one of those quotes, it's just like people don't realize right. how quickly momentum can shift. Right. Um, and well, and, and the thing to, the thing to add there too is because you do, you know, you said it well, you don't want to give people a false representation of how quickly, you know, of that it's going to happen overnight. But yeah. for, for guys like you or I, and especially in that time, I'm still this way. Like, I don't know what your day to day looks like, but like, I, I mean, a year for me, we're talking 80, 90 hour weeks. We're not talking oh, yeah. 40 hours, right? Like what you're doing yeah. in two years, I'm doing in eight months. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, I, and that's absolutely. We, and I call that um, condensing timelines. It's like the thing that I'm obsessed with is how can I condense timelines? Like how can I take what the normal person does in a decade and squeeze that into three or four years? How can I take what normal people accomplish in a year and squeeze into a quarter? And that's the only way you can truly level up and reach levels of success that other people's won't is by condensing the amount of time it takes you to get there. But that's just by packing more work in. Like this idea of work-life balance is just ridiculous to me that to me it's all about how much possible productive time can I spend in a daily ba- on a daily basis that puts me far so far and ahead of everybody else because I just know that they're not doing it. So like eliminating those time wasters and being able to condense timelines is what I'm 100% focused on right now. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, I could tell that you were focused on it when we first talked because, you know, I shared with you like how I manage my day to make mm-hmm. sure nothing falls through the cracks. Curious, are you, are you still using Trello? Dude, I am trying and I have not mastered it yet, but like every day I've got my iPad sitting next to me right now. Every day I'm like, all right, I'm going to start doing that. Um, so I have not mastered it yet, but I have a, I, I have a feeling it's going to become a part of what I do for sure. Uh, I love yeah, it. I, mean, I, I, I love the, I mean, I, there's so much about it that I love. I just hadn't started it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, like I, everything from in my real estate business, like each transaction is managed on a contract to close template. Each, my workouts on Trello, yeah. my, my weeks are on Trello, any Absolutely. projects that I'm doing, project management on Trello. Like, and that's what you just got to figure out what works for you, you know, but yeah. like, it, it, it all does come down to that obsession of, of condem- condensing timelines. I like that because, yeah. you know, for me, like right now I've got, you know, an almost 11 week old son who I need to spend time with. And mm-hmm. uh, that doesn't mean that I don't also need to scale my business dramatically faster than everyone else is even considering thinking about. Right. Yeah. And like, Absolutely. you know, for me, it's like, you know, you mentioned to grow exponentially and to be able to do this, dude, People aren't even, you know, a lot of individuals aren't even thinking this way, right? They just see the end result. They're not thinking, how do I get there? Yeah. And, you know, one thing I'll say to the, to the whole condensing timelines uh, piece is, you know, we mentioned in this story that I was 29 when I, when I made this transition out of this bad place in my life. So coming up on my 30th birthday was a big deal for me. Um, you know, whether it's 30, 40, 50, 60, wherever you are at in your life right now, but like, you know, I'm, I'm, I was coming up on 30 and you have these ideas of where you're going to be when you're 30. Like I had these ideas of where I would be financially and relationally, like, I, you know, this picture of who is Tyler Harris at, at 30. It wasn't anywhere close. It wasn't, and, it wasn't uh, basement divorced. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Phew, heck no. Yeah. And so luckily I had six months into this new business when I turned 30. So I'd already completely gotten out of debt. And like I was on a good yeah. track record and knew where I was headed. But man, uh, the problem I see so many people making, whether it's 30, 40, 50, 60, is this feeling of being behind, this feeling of, of having to catch up. And it leads to so many mistakes. It leads to so many um, decisions that are made that are probably too risky because you feel like you're, 
having to catch up and make up for lost time. And I see so many people that are making bad decisions because they feel rushed instead of just cramming more work into the same amount of time and being able to condense those timelines to be able to catch up in a healthy way. Um, people end up doing these things that they probably wouldn't have done if not for the fact that they felt like they were having to have some big win to get them back in the game. You know what I mean? So that's one thing that I definitely preach for people to avoid that no matter how old you are, no matter what milestone you're about to hit or, or just hit that as long as you're still breathing, you've got plenty of time. You know, I I would a hundred percent agree with that. And from like how you should frame your thinking, I mean, for me and, Granted, I'm a pretty radical thinker, right? Like most of the time, the way I'm thinking, people are confused. Like they're like, yeah, what the fuck are you saying? You know, sure. but like for me, like I always get super caught up on the idea of goal setting. Like, you know, I, I see people on online talking about goal setting, all this shit. And like, I, I, I get, I get it. Right. Mm-hmm. But like the only reason I even look at it somewhere where I would want to be in a year or two years or whatever is so that I can reverse engineer a daily task. And that is it, right? Like whenever I wake up in the morning, I don't think, hey, how can I, like, where am I going to be in six months? Or how am I going to be able to afford this in six months? Like, mm-hmm. I literally wake up with only the intention of going 100% all, all day today. Yeah, and it's, it's the only way I can string together any reasonable amount of good work. Because if you ask me, hey, can you, like, with complete honesty, say, can you, uh, you go all in for the next 365 days, right? Like, I don't know if that yeah. I can, right? Like, sure. probably, probably not. But yeah. if if you ask, if I say, Hey, I can go all in for the next 18 hours. Fuck. Yeah, I can. Like, yeah. and just do that every day. No, I, I agree with that a hundred percent. And, and I have a hard time putting these labels on, you know, where you're going to be in a year, five year, 10 years, because I feel like any label that I can possibly conceive in my brain right now is nowhere close uh, to what yeah. it's actually going to be. And so I just hate trying to like, you know, the law of attraction, you know, most people will say like, yeah, I, I believe in the law of attraction, but like most people don't believe it into uh, most people don't believe it enough to realize how you can freaking manifest some stuff you don't want. Like I have a feeling like right now, the way I would envision myself in five years is so small compared to where it could be. That yep. I don't want to, I don't want to spend any time envisioning something smaller. I don't want to spend any time envisioning something that like will literally hold me back from what was possible. You'll handicap so yourself. Just, right? Yeah. So I just focus on day to day. Like so many people, like a guy asked me, I was down at Gary V's event uh, last week in Miami and, and uh, this guy was like, so man, like what, so where's all this stuff? Uh, you know, what's all this stuff for? Like, where do you see this? You know, what do you see happening in five years? And I was like, bro, I have no idea. He's like, that's the most honest answer I've ever heard. And I'm like, I don't have any idea. Like I have no clue what it's, what it's all leading towards. I just know that tomorrow I'm going to get up and do more than it, of it than I did today. Boom. And, uh, and, and I know that over a period of time that that's going to probably end up well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, that's it. Like I, I, I told this guy, so I've got this camera guy, uh, rolling with me now and we cut, we cut this deal that he was going to hang with me for 90 days and produce content while I basically just plugged in with the, the fucking personal development sauce. And I was oh, just, yeah. gonna, I, I said like, the only, the only condition is you do whatever I, I want. Right. Under, under any circumstance. Yeah. And so we've been, he's been getting up early hit the gym with me doing some gnarly shit, but I was talking to him and I was like, dude, the only thing that matters to me is that I get up and I do a little bit better and I have a little bit more and I show up a, a little bit better for everyone than I did yesterday. And that's it. Absolutely. And that's by the way, enough. By the way, what you're doing with that guy is the best thing that'll ever happen to him. And so many more people need to take note. Like this idea, like with my videographers um, that I've had, like the idea of it being in an apprenticeship, not just like a videography, you know, job uh, is so huge to where like, I'm really, really pushing for younger kids to have some type of video editing, you know, film some type of prerequisite of them going through some type of training in that just so that they can be able to go and film someone and, 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 uh, shadow someone when they get towards, uh, where they're trying to, uh, actually pick a career path because it's, it's kind of like, you know, back in, um, back in, you know, like world war one, world war two civil war, all, all the major wars. If you think back, they, all the, um, generals had what they called aid to camps. And an aide-de-camp was basically like an assistant. 
But those assistants typically took over roles like this person was the general that was in charge of, you know, France. And this one right. person was in charge of Germany. But they started out as the general's assistant, their aide de camp. And so if you take that position, someone that's following someone around with a camera and, you know, whether it's creating a vlog or just creating content, like that person has a window into your life to where they can grow so freaking much over the course of 30, 60, 90 days. Um, it's, I'm seeing it right now with uh, my videographer, uh, Pablo, you know, when he moved here from Texas on a one hour conversation, uh, he wanted to be a school teacher. And now his mind has expanded so far beyond that, that it's crazy the things and aspirations that he has, because now he sees like what's possible. Like, Oh, you mean I could do anything? Got it. And now like the way he thinks is so much better. Dude, it's interesting. You know, you said that you you are almost ushering young guys to have some sort of, sort of that experience. And it occurred to me that, man, that's really the only value add that someone of no real value could get around a a higher level individual. I mean, because no one's going to be like, no, you can't shoot for me for free. Right. Like like they'll always take another angle if they're creating content. And Mm -hmm. then just through osmosis, like, I mean, dude, you hang, you hang around guys like us and it's pretty fucking hard not to want to be better. Yeah. It's going to make you very uncomfortable (laughs) very quickly for sure. Right. And I mean, dude, that's what I told. I'm like, listen, dude, like being around me can get intense. Like I'm, yeah. I'm fun and I'm a nice dude. And I like, I, I don't judge and shit, but like, listen, dude, like if I'm one thing, it's intense. Yeah. And like, you yeah. are going to get uncomfortable, but so let, like, let's talk about the importance of that while we're on the topic of uncomfortable. It's my yeah. favorite thing on the planet. So I want to hear yeah. your take. Yeah. So the, the line that we say over and over and over and over within our organization is uh, if you embrace discomfort, the world will deliver you pleasure. If you embrace comfort, the world will deliver you pain. And it's just universal, man. Like if you think about the easiest example in the gym, if you go to the gym and you get uncomfortable, then that's where you're going to grow. If you go to the gym and just stay comfortable, then nothing's going to happen. And so we have been in this, this, huge mission to seek discomfort in every possible way. And for me, it's almost to the point where I get, I I get uncomfortable when I start to feel comfortable in situations. Like the other day, I'm just like walking around my house. I'm like, man, it's a nice house. And and just anything I need, I forgot. And I was like, I started getting sick to my stomach. I'm like, oh crap. I'm like, I got to do right. something. Like my business partner takes ice baths every day. And he, he, he literally gets in his pool throughout the winter. He gets in his pool. It's like 40 degrees. The water is like 40 degrees. He gets in there and holds his breath and goes to the bottom as long as he can. Uh, stays in there for a few minutes every single day just as a way to shock his system. And just constantly putting ourselves in, in uncomfortable situations um, because that's the only way that you're going to grow. Uh, is by being comfortable with the uncomfortable. And, you know, some people take that to the extent, like, you know, David Goggins, you talking about him earlier. You know, I've been thinking a lot lately about, you know, when he talks about there, like there is no finish line mm-hmm. and about how like it never stops. And I'm like, ah, I don't like, that's kind of, it's kind of dark. Like, you know, you have to enjoy yeah. some part of life. Like, and so like, that's, I, I'm still kind of, unpacking that a little bit because when you talk about like being uncomfortable always and forever, uh, I'm not so sure. Uh, but I think that when you're in a uh, growing and transformative period of time that you always have to put yourself in situations where you can grow, which is going to be those uncomfortable situations that, that allow you to stretch. You know, that's, that's interesting because I I had to unpack that as well. Um, that, that took me a minute to, to sit on. And honestly though, where I landed was that that was comforting for me because I, my, my like natural state now is a period of growth and it's because I am constantly uncomfortable. And the only thing that, like you said, when you're feeling like you've got everything that you need, you start to feel uncomfortable by that. And for me personally, that's when I start to, that's when like the addict comes out and I I feel the need to be like self-destructive, push some people away, fuck fuck some shit up. Like, and so for me, that constant state of growth, that constant state of achievement is what I need. And so it's, it was comforting for me to be like, yeah, there is no finish line. And then some people will come in and be like, well, you know, you're not stopping to smell the roses or whatever the fuck they say. (laughs) Right. Like that doesn't mean that like my parents are ones who say that they're like, can't you just like chill the fuck out? And I'm like, Mm -hmm. 
shut your mouth. Like this doesn't, <laughs> this doesn't mean that I'm not yeah. taking time. I, mean, I, I, I can assure you, I spend more time in gratitude than you guys do. Yeah. 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 Well, and there's that whole reality, you know, based on actual science that it takes just as, as much energy to try to stay the same than it does to move forward. That when you're trying to stay the same, that your brain is going to create problems and create situations for you to fix in order for you to stay the same. So yeah. when you just, when you just take out the even possibility of there being some form of neutral, then you either have one of two ways to go. And I certainly don't want to go backwards. And so it's like, you don't want to like, you know, climb this hill just to one day start this slow digression. <laughs> you know, like, right. like that, that doesn't make any sense. So then in, in order to even stay where you are means that you basically have to keep pushing forward uh, every single day. And, and, you know, there's, there's certainly, um, you know, validity of that. I just think that, you know, once you hit a certain level of success, you start to have better problems. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, no, and it's what, what you were just saying is super interesting too, because I've never looked at the science of like staying the same. But yeah. what I know from personal experience is that like life is always going to do life. Like it, life will, oh, that's a machine that is always yeah. running and you just got to figure out how to fucking dodge yeah. it or hop, hop on, you know? So like, no matter how much, if I take five steps up, like I don't have to, something's going to knock me down a couple and I just got to make sure that I don't start rolling down the stair set. Right. I got to make sure yeah. that I'm just getting back up. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And I love, and I love how Goggins talks about the fact that like one day when he dies, that basically God was going to say, okay, here's the things that we had, you know, listed out that were going to happen in your life. But he talks in, this wasn't in the book. It was something I heard from him somewhere else where he talked about the fact that they're going to have to like, you know, rip that sheet of paper out and, and, and start a whole still be drinking start, spraying cockroaches. Well, like start a whole nother sheet of paper where God's like, I didn't see this happening and I didn't see this happening and no one thought this was going to happen. And that's on a whole separate sheet from all the things that, that were set out for him to accomplish in his life. And, and to me, that was extremely, extremely interesting. It's like to get to a point where you've already accomplished anything anyone would have ever imagined you would, but then still being able to keep pushing further. And there's, you know, there's a lot to be said that, but I think if you enjoy the process, which is more, most important, if you're enjoying the process of growing, then that's what makes it sustainable long-term. Well, that's where, that's where you and I are at. I was just about yeah. to say, I mean, dude, like my expectation was dead at 20, right? Yeah. When I hit, when I hit 21, people were like, wow. Yeah. Like, you know, and like, I love the process. I know that you love the process. Cause I see you yeah. out there like fucking running. And yeah. I see you up in the morning, walking down that cool stair set at your gym. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, it, it's like, it's the shit. And now like, because we're growing brands and we have, like legit social media presences then you know it, but what really matters is the shit when nobody's watching oh yeah yeah that whole how you do anything is how you do everything and to me like what you do and no one watching that's like that's my definition of integrity that yeah. is my absolute definition of integrity because it's so easy um it's so easy not to follow through when you know that no one else is ever going to know um but to me, that's, that's where you ultimately find out who you really are. And that, to me, that's where like that strength come from, comes from that you can pull on later on when you actually need it. It's like, yeah. oh, wait, remember all of those freaking mornings when I got up and did what I didn't feel like doing? And that's that strength that you hold on to when you, all of a sudden you get into a situation where you're like, crap, I don't know how I'm going to get th through this. And you're like, oh, wait, yeah, I do. That's what I've been waiting all this time for. That's what I've been training all this time for. Um, and to me, that, that's exciting. And, and, and I like being able to document that stuff on social media and, and show people, you know, be transparent, be authentic so that people can see the good, bad, and ugly. So that when you're, good, bad, when they're looking at your, you know, Instagram stories, that they're not just seeing like all the highlight reel type stuff that they're seeing real, um, you know, real footage of you, good, bad, or ugly. Uh, that's why I do so much live content. I mean, I did, you know, over 400 Facebook lives the first year I started documenting my life uh, because I wanted people to know the real me. And some of those yeah. lives were me freaking crying in the car because I'm about to go in my you know hotel room for the 11th night in a row. And I wanted to be at home with my six month old daughter, but I had you know, this stupid, crazy goal out there and was trying to hit it and, you know, just got emotional. But like the response that happened after that was unbelievable. Uh, yeah. people are like, Oh, this is an actual real human being that actually has emotions and goes through real stuff. 
so I think that's what we can do as creators is give people a real window into what it looks like and what it takes to succeed and not somehow sugarcoat it and make everybody think it's going to be some easy road to success. Well, man, you know, I said at the beginning of this podcast that I was super invested in you as a person and what you're doing. And that's part of the reason why, like, if you see my, so my stories on social media, like you've probably noticed that lately I've been a little bit heated about the state yeah. of social media, right? Like, oh, yeah. it's just like, like giving such a wrong representation. Like, dude, I cannot tell you how many times my poor wife has had to hold her husband who's supposed to be the supporter and the strong one, like fucking crying about the, you know, the circumstances that are going on, the risk mm -hmm. that I've taken, the yeah. pressure of this deal. Like, it, but really what it comes down to is, I mean, we are just like, we're normal dudes, good, bad, and ugly. Like, I mean, yeah. I fucking grew up in the, I'm, I'm a junkie from Missouri. Like that's how I still look at it, you know? And like, yeah. dude, if I'm out here playing this game, like dude, anyone can, yeah. if they're willing to suffer, if they're willing to persevere. Absolutely. It's not. And, yeah, no, I, I agree with you a hundred percent. And I think that's why I'm so excited about the market correction. Uh, I'm excited Same. for the market to just absolutely just collapse because it's going to, there's going to be some shakeout and there's going to be a lot of that fake stuff is going to be gone. A lot of people aren't going to be able to afford the extra ad spend to put their, you know, ridiculous content out there and they're not going to be able to afford to, you know, create these videos with fake cars and fake women and fake houses and all this stuff. And, and the real people out there that have built real businesses um, are going to prevail. And, and that's what the market needs right now is for that to happen as quickly as possible. So I, I cannot wait. We're building strategy upon strategy to capitalize uh, on that happening with the expectation that the return is going to be huge. Um, totally. And able to actually like capture people and they're like, oh, you mean that guy's real? And, and show, you know, and some people that, that aren't ready for it, they'll be able to document the process of, of going down and it'll be helpful for them as well. Like, and and we'll I hope that happens. That's interesting. That's interesting. That's not an angle I that's, had thought about. Dude, that I, I can't remember who I was talking about with that uh, about that recently, but like that's the best possible scenario for someone that's like a financial advisor or a real estate agent. And when the market crashes, for them to document every step of the way and how bad it gets, and to be completely brutally honest, like I have this much left in my checking account. I have this many days until I get my final late notice notice on my house. I've got this many days until my car gets repossessed and to document that whole process and then swing back up and get everybody's admiration because they watched you go through that. And they're so happy for you that you pulled through. Like that's going to be the ultimate, ultimate freaking documentation. Um, not that I'm wanting to do that myself. Though. <laughs> I'm not I, I signing. Mean, I'm not signing up for that list, but, but still like the opportunity. People won't do it. Yeah. I mean, e yeah, the, very, I mean very, 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 ego. very, 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 very small percentage. Ego, pride, it'll all get in the way. Yeah. It'll all get in the way. But I would love to see someone execute on that opportunity. I mean, it's a it's the hero's journey, dude. Oh, yeah. It's what everybody it, everybody has their version of the hero's journey. Like, you know, you yeah. mentioned it earlier, you know, you were saying, you know, your daughter's bad may not be a rock bottom may not be our rock bottom, hopefully is sure. severe, yeah. right? But it's still her journey, right? Mm -hmm. And every, people love to see that. Like I, I got obsessed with, for a little bit, with studying the work of Joseph Campbell. Are you familiar with him? Nope. So he, uh, you know, he, he really dug into this idea of the hero's journey and why it plays out so well in, you know, film, storytelling, real life. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I highly recommend checking him out, Joseph Campbell. Yeah. Um, but dude, so tell, tell me this, like what's the primary focus now? Are you doing good? Are you doing okay on time? I'm great. I'm great. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, you sold, you set to fucking crush every record in the world for life insurance policies, right? Became the owner of the company. You're, you're recruiting agents, opening up stuff. You started doing all these Facebook lives. You put out something like 9,000 pieces of content or some crazy shit. And, uh, do you, you have, you're not monetizing your audience at all. And I think it's, I think it's admirable, right? Like what, why are you doing this? I don't know. <laughs> uh, isn't a freaking a glutton for punishment, I think. Um, no, I mean, it's, you know, it's, 
for me, it's legacy a lot. Uh, a lot of it has to do with legacy. Um, you know, the legacy that I'm going to leave behind one day, like this interview will be able to be watched by my daughter when she's 30. And you know, maybe she'll be going through something at that point that this will hit her and she'll be like, crap, my dad was just, my dad was talking about me, you know, 28 years ago. And now I'm going through this footage lives on forever. Um, the reason why I don't monetize uh, anything that I'm doing is because I don't need anything from anyone. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's, it's funny. Uh, I love Ed Milet. Great guy. Seems like a great guy. I don't know him personally. Um, but I, I hear his name thrown around with me so often like, Oh, it's like Ed Milet. Like, you know, so great. He doesn't really monetize anything, which he does. Uh, but I'm like, you know, Ed Milet is top 50 under 50 net worths in the United States. And yeah, he's blown up on social media over the last 18 months and given all this value for free. I'm like, if he didn't give that value for free, he'd be a, the biggest dick on the planet. He's the right. top 50 under 50 net worth in the U.S. So it's one thing for Ed Milet to come out and start giving a bunch of value for free. It's a different thing for a guy that's on an upward trajectory to get there and could cash in and could monetize and could make money off of all the time we're spending. I'll, I'll spend 300 grand this year on all this stuff that we're doing, plus the freaking five, six hours a day on all this stuff, but still not monetizing. And I think that I will... At one, at some point, I will be looked at as the only person that, from where they were to where they are today, ever documented the journey uh, without monetizing it, without asking anything for anything in return. And if I can do that, then it means that everything else was probably going pretty well. <laughs> like yeah, totally. it means that all the other businesses were probably pretty successful if I was able to not monetize. This whole thing with Gary, Gary V, and he talks about whoever can hold their breath the longest wins. I believe that a hundred percent. I believe that whenever I do, if I do, that the return is going to be so exponentially greater than if I were, if, than if I would have all along the way, um, because of the amount of disproportionate value, like the amount of people that feel like they will have literally known me for 10, 15 years before I ever asked them for anything. They'll be able to do, they'll be willing to do anything. Um, and again, that not even being the intent on the front end. It's just, you know, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I love doing it. The messages that I get, the comments that I get, the life changing stuff is like a drug for me. Um, and I just want more and more and more of it. Like, you know, I, I feel an intense, intense responsibility to put this stuff out there because of those mentors that came into my life four and a half years ago. And what they did for me, them breathing life back into me, uh, changed the course of the rest of my life. And so for me to be able to do this and not do it, it's like, what kind of person would I be? If I had the capability, I had the wherewithal to put this type of content out and I didn't, uh, knowing that it could change somebody else's life, then that's a hard pill to swallow. And so we're just trying to put out as much content as humanly possible. Uh, we call it scaling impact. Uh, and trying to have that ROI be the lives impacted by the stuff that we're putting out. Um, and that's really the way we look at, you know, our return is, Hey, how many messages did we get this week from people that said that, you know, they were suicidal, but they came across a piece yeah. of content. And over the last three months, they've you know really gotten their life back together. I mean, that's the stuff that, that really matters. You know, the universe will never be indebted to you. Yeah. And uh, I just believe with all my heart, uh, almost to the point where it's, it's, it's almost a burden, uh, but it's just an intense responsibility just to give back and pay it forward. You know, when we did our podcast together, you said something um, that I've still been unpacking and you were talking about, you know, a transition that you had around the time that you first had your daughter. And I don't remember if it was Sean Waitlin that said this to you. Someone said to you, you know, you were like, oh, I'm living, I'm going to leave this legacy yeah. online for my daughter. And they were like, what about the legacy that you leave in the house, right? Mm -hmm. Not just in there. Um, and I've been wrestling with that statement yep. that you made to me since then, man. Yeah, so... You know, it was over the course of about 11 hours of, of him asking me why I do what I do, why I'm doing all this stuff on social media. And I kept saying, oh, yeah, legacy, it's legacy, you know, kind of like the answer I just gave you. Right. Um, but about 11 hours in, he's like, all right, I just want you to write out kind of what you're feeling, what you're thinking, and I'll be back in a few minutes. Comes back. At the top of the page, I wrote, what kind of legacy am I really leaving if my daughter's going to have to watch these videos? 
to hear the words that should be coming out of my mouth to her in person. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about legacy, you're exactly right. I, I talk about the legacy that I'm leaving in my family, not for my family. Because legacy that you're leaving for your family, that's like you're dead, you're gone. The legacy that yeah. was left behind. I'm talking about leaving a legacy in my family, like present tense while I'm here. Um, so like, you know, a lot of people don't realize this because they see so much, you know, stuff going on, on on social media and they see all this content being, you know, repurposed from over the last two years. But I've been home for seven months since that happened. Yeah. Like I've literally, like since I had that switch in my head and priority change, like I've literally been home for seven months uh, where I was four nights on the road every single week, every single week. Um, and so a lot of things have shifted. Like I, I spend, like, so Pablo, my videographer, he just started, um, you know, four months ago and he had seen all the content that came out before and about a month in, he was like, I had no idea that you spent so much time with your family. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, like, cause it's, it's the most important thing. Um, and luckily I have a, a wife that supports me in what I do and she's super strong and super independent when I do have to travel. And so she was completely on board when I was traveling. Um, mm -hmm. but it, you know, to me, it's about being all in, in all areas. And, and I think that's the problem that people have with work-life balance is that they use it as a way to, convince themselves that they need to work less when really they just need to spend more time in all those areas and quit wasting so much time. Yeah. So, like, I mean, dude, that's the thing about like talking about success and like life work life balance. Like, I mean the whole fucking thing, there's just a dichotomy. Like you're just getting hit with like, if you're a young guy, I can't imagine sifting through all this stuff now. Cause there's just so many head fakes. Yeah. You know? Yep. No, it's ridiculous. And, and to me, so I, I've completely taken off the table any, any idea of ever having balance. To me, it's just, it's all about recognizing the imbalances and being able to adjust accordingly uh, as quickly as possible. So being able to realize that, you know, um, I haven't been communicating with my wife well for, you know, a few days and me being able to quickly be aware of that and adjust but yeah. as soon as I adjust, I'm going to figure out an imbalance somewhere else. And so it's always being able to be aware of where the imbalance lies and then being able to adjust your effort and adjust the time that you're spending accordingly. But the idea that it's ever going to be in perfect balance is ridiculous. So if you think about it more of just like a harmony to where it's just like always constantly ebbing and flowing, but you're just like aware, adjust, aware, adjust, aware, adjust, and just become a normal part of your life. Uh, to me, that's way more realistic than somehow like telling some person that you're going to give them the secret to, you know, happiness through balancing their home life and work life and body. And you know, it's just, it's ridiculous. See, for me, for me, it's like, like I truly believe in mind, body, spirit business. Like that's what you need to be happy. But like, dude, you like, obviously me hearing like the idea of, balance like work life anything like that like i'm a fucking alcoholic right like yep. i don't i only think one mode and that's full speed yeah. right so for me it's just like no matter what my one track brain is thinking at that time i need to be doing it the best that i can I need to be showing up the best that i can if and then you know what it came down to was structure in yep. in, in the way that i managed my time i had to become very very good at time management and yep. then just making sure that i'm showing up for only that and being present. It's not like, for me, it's not how am I balancing work with family? It's like, okay, during this time I'm with my family and I'm with my family. Right. Absolutely. And during this other time I'm at, I'm working and I'm fucking working. Yeah. I mean, when, when I was traveling so much, it's funny, I would have friends that, that would say, man, you need to, you know, you're gone so much. You need to be home. You know, you've got a daughter, you've got a wife. And I would look at them very, very, very bluntly and say, man, I spend more quality time with my wife than you do. And you're home every night. Right. Of course and they I, said and, that shit. And I was like, gone four nights a week, but when I was home, I was home and I was very intentional with my time because I, I didn't take it for granted. There's a big difference between being pr present and being available, right? Like yeah. you, know, you may be there in the physical form, but you're not really there emotionally. You're not really there like intentionally uh, paying attention to what's going on around you and, and soaking it in. And like, for me, I, 
I think there's a lot to be said for forcing every man to work like a territory or work somewhere where they don't live and, and travel because there's something to be said for being gone away from your family and coming back to it that makes you appreciate it so much more. And it makes you, you know, for me, it made me more intentional about that time and wanting to soak up every second that I had with my family before I hit the road again. And uh, that feeling, you know, those butterflies of coming back home and, you know, I, I don't, I, I think it's a good thing. Um, you know, I think everybody should experience that to some degree, uh, maybe not to the degree of 230 nights in a hotel. Um, but you know, nonetheless, like it's all in perspective and how you look at it. Yeah, man, dude, in 2017, I spent, uh, I spent Monday through Thursday gone on the road yeah. for six months oh, and yeah. it is, uh, it, it, that is a truly, um, it's an, it's an experience and, and, and I can't tell you the like growth that my wife and I had there. Like we were fairly codependent before that, you know, yeah, and sure. we had, to, we had to grow as people mm -hmm. to be able to make it. Um, super interesting. So, okay. T let me ask you this. Let's switch gears for a second. Who are some of the most major influences you've had in your life? Obviously you've had, you said you had those mentors come in early on, but like who helped man? I mean, yeah, my dad has been, has played a huge, huge role in my life. Um, he's one of those people that has always been so consistent. He's the hardest worker that I know to a fault. Um, like just the hardest, just will do, he, he can outwork anyone. Um, and has been so consistent throughout my life and his relationship with my mom, his relationship with us, um, his relationship with God. Like he's just an incredible, incredible human being. My mom as well. Um, you know, not to sound like silly, but like Gary V has played a, a gigantic role in my life. Like I, I told him that this past week, uh, we went to this VIP dinner at this event that he had. And, uh, you know, when I was going through that, that first two years of this transition, pretty much all I listened to was Gary V and all I watched was Gary V. And like, that's why this, this, you know, content distribution strategy that we've, that we've launched and why I'm putting out so much content, why I'm not asking for anything in return. It's just the Gary V blueprint played out in real life. Yep. Um, and, and like, I, I just, there are so many, so much deeper layers of understanding to what he's really, really doing. Like when you start really thinking about the fact that he's making these alpha male uh, characteristics, cool, like empathy. And empathy yeah. Mm -hmm. And like you start talking about like, like people that look up to him and the things that he talks about, it's, it's some important stuff. Like I, I dude, making, I, that shit, making that shit cool is straight up shattering like the course of history at its core. Oh yeah. And, and, and doing it the way he's doing it. Like it's, it's, um, it's incredible. Like I, I'm, I, I think that I probably, um, under, I'm trying to think of the best way to say it. I probably don't commu communicate enough in just how big of a role that he's played. Like before I started doing anything on social media, I spent four hours with him in a conference room, him and Andy Frisella uh, in a conference room for four hours till three 30 in the morning, uh, just talking about all this stuff before I ever started doing anything on social media. Um, and then the subsequent times that I've, that I've met with both those guys, Andy's been a huge, made a huge impact in my life as well. He's one of the rawest, like realest people that I know. Um, and has come into my life in a, in a couple of times where it was, you know, him coming to me saying, Hey bro, you want some feedback? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And him giving me some like real, you know, advice. Um, so yeah, you know, those, you those know, two I, have been impact. I need to get in contact with Andy. I mean, I'm just three hours from him, you know, a little yeah. less, like I need to yeah. get up, I need to get up there to see him, um, and figure that out. And dude, I mean, Gary has been a huge huge impact in my life as well my only dude my only beef with gary is that he fucking is always hating on the idea of a 25 year old uh coach like well it says life coach and, and and to be honest i get it and he he has said like i admit there's some unicorns i yeah. like to consider myself a unicorn you said it on your podcast you're like yeah. i didn't really know what to think yeah. I mean, well, I think when you consider your history, you're probably like 45 in like yeah. you know, normal people's, uh, like your life experiences age you like, you know, TJ, 
that used to be my videographer. He's like an 80 year old trapped in a 24 year old's body. Like, you know, there's certain people that their maturity levels, you know, on a, on another level and just their life. I mean, the sheer life experiences will grow a person more than, you know, the amount of time they've been on the earth. But, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's some stuff. I mean, he, he's an alien. Like I legitimately believe that he may be an alien. Like I know a lot of people that talk to him on a daily basis and they, and he never, they can never like Andy, Andy always talks about the fact that like he can't talk to him and, and go into anything other than business. Whereas he'll talk to Grant Cardone and they'll talk for half an hour and not mention anything about business. Gary, it's only, only business. But thing is like, he loves it. Like, you know, I've come to this realization, you know, recently here, like, you know, started thinking about the outside from the outside looking in, it appears as though I have zero social life because I don't go out. Like I quit drinking. Like I don't go out to bars. I don't, you know, hang out with a bunch of friends on the weekends, things like that. But the reality is I have the greatest social life ever because my business partners and the people that I work with are my best friends. The things that I do, like what I'm doing right now with you is what I, I consider fun. So like I have fun all the time and I'm with my friends all the time. Like I have the best life, but from the outside looking in, it's like, oh, all he does is work. I'm like, no, that's where you're wrong. Like, this doesn't work to me. I would do it whether I was making money doing it or not, which I'm not. <laughs> like, like a lot you're of like, not, right. like, like, that's like, the thing. It's like, that's the only reason I'm willing to do this stuff um, is because I just absolutely love it. And I just, man, it's gotten to this weird point with me now. And I'm going to start probably getting a lot more vocal. It comes across as like calling people out, which, you know, I'm just going to have to get a lot more vocal uh, uh, and upfront with people about it. But to me now, like there's enough information out there mm-hmm. and I get it. Like if somebody doesn't know who Gary Vee is, it always like drives me crazy. Like I feel like it's like telling me they've never heard of water, you know, <laughs> like people that like don't understand all this stuff. And the majority of people don't understand all this stuff, but like people that, that get it a little bit. Like if you have an iPhone and you have the ability to hit record and just talk, and you choose not to, you're literally robbing your kids, you're robbing your grandkids, you're robbing your great grandkids of the most powerful content that they will ever, ever, ever see. Like the stuff that they would absolutely cherish. Like, you know, when someone dies, like someone's grandmother dies and they find some like crinkled up diary, oh, like in an old yeah. box. And they're like, Oh, I've been reading my grandmother's diary for like the last 60 days in a row. And I just can't, you know, I carry it everywhere I go. Like imagine that, but finding a thousand hours of videos, <laughs> like imagine like being able to watch a video of your dad when he was 30 building a business. And like just behind the scenes footage of him like talking about you when you were four at the time or, you know, whatever. Like they would, I I would watch those videos every single night. Like that's what I would go to sleep to every night would be watching my dad, watching my granddad, watching my mom. And so if you have the ability to do that and you are choosing not to, like I have a like, you know, that whole drawn line in the sand, like I have a really hard time with that. Like someone is choosing not to. Yeah. And they're robbing, they're robbing future generations from content that they would absolutely die for. And man, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a tough one for me. Um, and so, you know, that's what I'm doing. Like, that's like, I'm doing this with the intent of people seeing this a hundred years from now. Um, and I think that there's, there's something powerful when you look at it with that long-term vision. That's, in- that's interesting, man. You know, I, I, my mind was just going a million different directions. I mean, because I've, I like hate it whenever I see someone that just like, and this is me judging, which I shouldn't be doing. <laughs> right. But when I'm just yeah. like, like I see it in normal people. And sometimes I'm like, wow, you could really use like the 12 steps to AA or right, like, right. Like this, yeah. person could use, this person could use some personal development. Right. And like, that's me yeah. judging, which is a character defect, but like, fuck man, it's all there. Like, don't you like, I struggled early on like with, you know, people in my family, my parents, for example, right? Like, don't you guys want to be better than you were yesterday? And after, you know, years of banging my head against the wall, it just came down to, I think the answer is no. And that's okay because yeah. that's, that, that's their choice. Yep. Yeah. And, and the thing is like, if they're happy, then, and they're not complaining all the time, then like, that's awesome. Like, like it's the people that are complaining about like, you know, their life, but they're not doing anything about it. That really give me, you know, a lot of, a lot of heartache. Uh, but like, if someone's happy, like I get it. Like, you know, you, you, you're in the bowling league and you play basketball and you're, 
you know, constantly at the bars, you're doing this and, and like, you're having fun and you're happy. And like, that's, that's fantastic. It's not for me, but that, like, that's great for you. It's the ones that like still complain about like, Oh, you know, so-and-so got this raise and you know, that should have been me and yada, yada, yada. It's just yeah. that's the stuff that um, drives me crazy. But you know, again, like well, that's just not, you know, that goes back to you take like someone taking extreme ownership. Like, I mean, dude, you have, we talked about it in business, in your life, in your family, how you deal with other people. Like, let's also talk about like, dude, you have taken serious ownership of your health. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, I mean so, so, so for people who haven't seen you, like, I don't know what you used to look like, but you're a dude, monster now. Dude, I could show you before and after picture that would just gross you out. Like it's the best before and after picture, but I don't even like looking at it. Cause this, because that guy is that, that 27 year old version of me that was like just hitting rock bottom. And dude, I was fat. I was like 270 pounds and, uh, not how tall are you? Six foot. So like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, not, so, so, so not like a, you know, linebacker, 270 pounds. Um, yeah, it was bad. It was, it, I mean, it's horrible, but, um, you know, for me that the transition there came from when I finally realized that you can't outwork a bad diet. Um, yeah. you know, forever, I just worked out hard enough to be able to eat whatever I wanted. And so I never really was getting anywhere, but I like, you know, I would fluctuate. Uh, but once I started getting it right in the kitchen and I, and I do the whole ketogenic diet, that's kind of just what I have found that my body responds to the best. Um, and when I'm on it, man, I, I feel incredible. Um, and again, like for a guy like you and me, like again, being very all in the ketogenic, all in. the ketogenic diet for me is very easy because if I think like, man, I'd love to go home tonight and have like a freaking huge pizza. But if I think about the fact that like, well, it's going to throw me out of ketosis, it's going to take me a couple days to go back in. I'm going to feel like garbage in the morning. Just that five, 10 seconds of like contemplation. I'm like, ah, it's not really, I really don't want it that bad. And I'll eat yeah. something good. And yeah. so it's like with the ketogenic diet, you're either in ketosis or you're not like, or ketogenesis, you know, you're either yeah. in it or you're not. And so for me, it's that enabled me to, to stick with it. And, um, and yeah, so, I mean, it's, but again, it's all about embracing discomfort. Like I don't love eating the foods that I, that I eat and I would love to be able to eat other stuff, but like, you know, it's uh, priorities. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. See, like, man, 270. Yeah, that's big. I, I was 250, no muscle. You yeah. know, now I'm like 215, pretty lean. Yeah. Um, but dude, I mean, honestly, the best I've, my wife and I, we have not eaten, we've been vegans for two years. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Just, and for me, like the level of mental, mental clarity that I got off of that was yeah. why I wanted it on top of the fact that it was just in like, who the fuck? Like, and I was like a meat eater, dude, you know, like yeah. uh, you know, salami sandwich. Like that's my shit. Oh but, yeah. Like, you know, just the intensity of like, wow, I'm not going to eat an animal product ever again. I, I fuck with that. Yeah. I'm not going to do that. I've literally been contemplating going on the carnivore diet. Have you heard about the carnivore diet? I have not, but I can tell you I mean, right now, I firmly disagree. <laughs> it's huge, right? It's literally all you eat is red meat. Like it's all you eat. Uh, it's just crazy. Like you can have certain things with it. They metabolize differently, like certain like fruits that I can't eat. Uh, but dude, like it all gets, it, it all boils down uh, to discipline. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's what it all boils down to. And you can tell a lot about a person, um, about, a lot about the other areas of a person's life by how disciplined they are with what they eat and, and with their body. And um, that's why everything you do with, with, um, with all your folks that you're, that you're coaching. And that's what we do with all the people that we're coaching um, is coaching them on all four of the areas of life and understanding that like the business side is usually what we talk least about. Yeah. Honestly, like every one of my coaching calls, the business part is like the very last five, 10 minutes that we just, you know, that we just glance over because if they're winning in their relationships, if their body and their mind are in the right place, then of course they're going to be doing better in their business. It's a byproduct. It's like a, a look good, feel good, play good situation, right? Like, yeah. you know, it's just like, I mean, especially if you're in like a sales track, like, you know, you or I have been, yeah. it, that shit, it's not that complicated. What's complicated is the human condition, right? Like being able to actually implement, take action on a consistent basis, not yeah. fucking go crazy. Like that's, that's what it comes to. How you do one thing is how you do everything. It's the biggest cliche that is overlooked. And it, it, it's the only thing that matters. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there's like, there's no, like, and I don't care what you think about this diet, that's di- this diet, that diet, vegan, freaking ketogenic, like it's all discipline. Like no one's getting fat from eating sweet potatoes. Right. Like, <laughs> like people that are like, oh, you got to have carbs. Like I, I get that, but like, you don't have to have chips and pizza. <laughs> like, like, yeah, it's like, like okay. Like, it's like, you know, like no one's getting fat off of brown rice and, and, uh, and sweet potatoes. So like, again, it all, it all boils down to, um, the biggest thing, which, you know, we could probably close with is just clarity. Um, you know, getting super clear on what you actually want. Like, like what does success look like for you? What does winning, what is being extraordinary? Like what, like getting super, super clear and then having the discipline to put a structure around your life so that you can, that you can get there. Uh, but until you figure out, you know, what it is that you really want. And it's, it sounds like such an easy question, but it's the most difficult freaking question uh, totally. to really unpack. And you're going to constantly, you're going to constantly, um, you know, be transitioning and, and changing what that looks like. Uh, but to kind of get super crystal clear on what it, on what it looks like, um, you know, how are you going to freaking create a roadmap to an undone destination? <laughs> yeah, you're just, you're just, a, you're, you're just adrift. You know, yeah. and it, it's easy for us to, t- to tell the listeners that, right. But how'd you get clear? I know how I did and I, I'll go into it, but I want to hear how you got clear. It was just through a process of having someone hold me accountable and keep asking me why. So what do you want? But why, but what does that look like? Yep. Okay. Well, what is life going to look like when you have that? Okay. But why? Okay. But so what does that look like? Literally, it was just repeatedly going through and like kind of taking it level by level by level by level by level until a couple hours later, we're like, oh, gotcha. So that's actually what you want. Not this like frothy little like, you know, cool way of like saying what everybody else says on top. Like, I want to be financially free. It's like, yeah, great. we talked about that on yeah, your yeah, podcast. Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, like figuring out what like life actually looks like um, in your ideal scenario and then creating a map to get there. Um, and, and sometimes people realize it's, it's easier than they think. Like sometimes yeah. it's, it's not as crazy far fetched as, as they think, like they think this idea of where they ultimately want to get is so far removed from the actual things that are going to make them happy when they get there. Well, it's, it's like that. It's like that. impossible. It, 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 they do make it impossible. It's like that picture of you seen, it, it's like how to make a million dollars, right? And then it's like you charge X amount of customers this and it shows you like 10 different ways. And it's like, well, that seems pretty reasonable, yeah. you know? Like, and then, so what I wanted to say is for me, getting clarity, like the, I have always struggled to become clear on what I want, but I'm really, really good at becoming clear at what I don't want. And sure. by, by inverse, I'm able to figure out what I do want, right? So I can tell you that like, you know, I don't want to grow up the way I grew up. I don't want to feel like shit. I don't want to look like shit. I don't want my kid to see this guy who is dealing with, who's egotistical and all this shit, you know, like I can really tell you what I don't want. And just by looking at that on paper, it's pretty easy to figure out what you do want. Yeah, no, I agree. And, 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 you know, a lot of those things that you just mentioned were kind of adjectives or, or descriptions of who people are. And I think that that's like, that's the big thing is figuring out, okay, this is what I want. Now figuring out who you have to become to get it. Yeah. Like that's, that's right now what I'm constantly trying to tell people is like, if you're struggling right now and you're going through some type of pain, there is a blessing on the other side of it, but it's waiting for you to become the person that can receive it. And so you're going through that process. You're going through that struggle. You're going through that pain right now because it's toughening you. It's, it's strengthening you. It's like strengthening your will. It's strengthening your resilience so that you be, can become a person that can handle the blessing that's on the other side of it. And so it's like constantly trying to figure out, okay, here's my 2019 goal. But in 2019, I want to make this much money. I want to have this. I want to do that. I want to go here. Yada, yada, yada. Cool. Who is the person that can do that? Like, who's the person that made that much money? Who's the person that bought that house? Who's the person that went on that trip? And then reverse engineering what you have to do on a daily basis to become that person. When you can start chasing after a person, you can start putting like adjectives and qualities and descriptions on that person to where that person becomes like a real life, like avatar of you at the end of 2019. And you can literally start visualizing yourself in those shoes a year from now 
And man, that takes, that takes everything to another level, whether, where it's not just like how many you know dollars did I earn this week towards what I ultimately want to earn this year. It's like, no, how much closer did the, I come this week to becoming the person that I know that I'm going to have to become in order to, to take my life to where, where I want to go and to take my organization to where I want to go. That's one thing I've seen my business partner do um, and, and been able to watch him do so incredibly is he knew that in order to get our organization to where we're going, he was going to have to become a different person. He was going to have to be able to handle different things. And so I've seen him put himself through so much discomfort uh, over the last three, four years um, on purpose to become a person that could handle all the things that he's had to handle over the last you know, year, 18 months. And it's been awesome to watch someone do that intentionally and for it to like play out perfectly. It's like, man, right. now, and, and you know, it's all, you know, a lot of times it's in hindsight. You don't always say like, oh, I'm going through this thing right now so that I can go through that later. But it's in going through those things, you're understanding that, of course, there will be a situation that's going to pop up next year that this is going to come back and, and really give me the strength to get through it. You know what I mean? Well, dude, the kind of guy that dives to the bottom of the 40 degree pool every morning, that's my kind of guy. Like, oh, that's yeah. what I like. That's what I like, you know. Yeah. Um, I think that we are at a really, a really good closing point, dude. Sure. Um, I mean, you and I could go, like, you're the only person who's been on who I'm like, fuck. Like, I was thinking, we're probably going to have to do round two <laughs> at some yeah, point. For sure. For sure. Uh, but, dude, I, ju I just love shooting shit with you. I appreciate you yeah, taking man. the time to come on. I know that you got all sorts of stuff that you got going on. And I think that, you know, everybody listening is going to take a ton of value from this. So, it. dude, you were totally appreciated by, I'm sure, everyone in your life. Absolutely. And I appreciate you, man. Like the stuff that you're doing is incredible. The, the things that you're teaching uh, people on a daily basis. Um, I mean, it's just the way you show up in the world and I can't, uh, couldn't be more proud. Um, and the fact that now you've got a son, so I know it's about to just get set on fire because uh, it did for me. And, and as that son actually turns into a human being, not just like this little alien that poops and pees and yeah. screams when, when all of a sudden he starts talking and starts like having like conversations and realizing what's going on. It's just like, you're like, holy crap, I've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah, dude. It's I'm fun. so, I'm so excited. You know, we're at the point now where like, He's just like making noises and like yeah. smile, smiling. Oh, dude. It, yeah. I mean, stops me in my tracks every time. Oh, yeah. Um, so, hey, before we wrap up, tell everyone where they can find you. I know that you just got a new IG handle. Yeah. So, everything is at Tyler Jack Harris. And uh, we just launched the website actually today. So, if you go to tylerjackharris.com, um, go there. Um, we've definitely given out some free stuff there, including a book that I just uh, finished, which is the Sales Wolves book based off of our Sales Wolves podcast. You can download the PDF there. Um, but yeah, I'd love to connect with people. Shoot me a message. I promise I will respond. Uh, it may not be in 30 seconds, but it'll definitely be within 30 days. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Well, Tyler, again, thanks for coming on, man. Yeah, my pleasure.